Welcome back to SIHH 2019 Live. Uh, here we welcome during the week the ideas and the people of uh, Haute Horlogerie. And uh, today we are now for this session, we are going to have as a guest uh, an exceptional watchmaker. 14 years ago, uh, he ventured out with a band of friends and set up a new brand, uh, which is more of a lab than uh, anything else, really. They create fearless, futuristic, highly innovative uh, timepieces. And along the way, they've had, yes, a lot of success, but also made some mistakes. And so he's here to talk about that, too, the do's and don'ts of creating a watch brand. Please welcome Maximilian Busser. Thank you very much. So um, when Bruno contacted me uh, a month ago, he said, what would you like to talk about? I said, um, actually, I'd like to talk about all the mistakes we've made. And we made a ton of mistakes in the last 14 years, so I'm not sure 20 minutes is enough. Um, MBNF is a life decision. It's not a business decision. It's, um, sorry, I'm losing my mic already from the beginning. It's, um, it's a decision which came uh, because I love watchmaking. Watchmaking saved my life. I've been creating watches for 27 years. And um, I lost myself at some point. The young child who was very creative became a marketeer. So in my 14 years of working for beautiful big brands, I started creating for the public. I started creating products because I thought people would like them. And I lost myself. And one day, after my dad passed away 17 years ago, I realized um, I don't have any regrets in life. I have to create for myself. And I have to create and work only with people who share the same values. That's what would make me proud the last day of my life. So, 2005, in the middle of a beautiful career, I take this crazy step of resigning, and on the 25th of July 2005, I incorporate MBNF, Société Anonyme, and um, that's a company which is actually just me in my little flat for two years without a salary, and I put all my savings. I had a sizable amount of money I'd put aside. I come from a family with no money, so I'd put aside 900,000 Swiss francs. That's a lot of money, but you want to create a beautiful mechanical watch brand, you better have 10 million, and you still have 90% chance of failing. So I put my 700,000 in the company, keep 200,000 to live without a salary for two and a half years, and a little bit of in case of, and start. So um, the brand is called MBNF, Maximilian Busser and Friends. Who are the friends? Are, this was actually the, the initial team you see behind me I, I created the piece with. Um, all the incredible artisans, watchmakers, engineers, people who are going to actually allow me to transform my crazy idea into a reality. And what is my reality? I believe watchmaking is art. Everybody says the watchmaking art. But if it's art, why are 99.9% .9 of watches more or less the same? What I wanted to do is deconstruct traditional watchmaking and reconstruct it into a 3D kinetic art piece, which, oh, by the way, gives you time, but that's not the point. And what I wanted to do was unsellable. So here I go, put all my savings in the company, and uh, luckily, six retailers believed in me and not only ordered the pieces based on a drawing, but actually funded one third in advance two years before I, got, uh, I managed to deliver the first piece to them. So it seemed to be a perfect story from the beginning. And if I show you the graph here to the end, these are all my numbers. In um, green, the amount of million of revenue. You can see that I created the company in 2005. In 2007, we delivered the first 30 pieces for 2.5 million Swiss francs. In green is the amount of million Swiss francs, the revenue. In 2013, I'm going to take a very bold decision. I'm going to stop the growth of my company. My dream was 15 employees, 15 million francs, and about 300 watches. We hit that in 2013, the year I had my first daughter. And I decided we're not going to grow anymore. 
and we stayed flat. So more or less, we're at 16.9 million Swiss francs, 218 watches last year. When you look at this, it looks like a walk in the park. We had four horrible years. We nearly went bankrupt once, and this is the, what I'm going to try and tell you now and what I learned from that. 2006, I'm on a cloud, everything is going great. My main supplier, the company which was actually engineering my first movement, manufacturing all the parts and going to assemble all the movements, gets sold overnight in the month of May to a brand. That brand had no intention whatsoever of creating movements for third parties. So 2006 was a nightmare, a lot of deceit, a lot of lies, and I was going crazy. And in, uh, this is the first movement, 365 components. And in 2007, the first week of 2007, the new owner of that company tells me, I'm not going to assemble your movements. I said, sorry, I'm not going to assemble your movements. It's the only time in my whole life that I groveled. I was like, please, don't do that. I practically got no more money anymore. If you don't assemble the movements, I'm dead. And the guy said, that's it. Luckily, that day with me at that meeting was a man called Peter Speakmarin. And Peter, seeing me groveling for way too long, took my arm at some point and said, we'll deal with it. I'll make a long story short, it's an incredible story. Peter is going to save my company by calling that day all the watchmakers he knew, all the independent watchmakers, bring them to the table, and uh, five of them came to save my company. It took them six months to assemble the first movement. Six months, I mean, you normally take about two to three weeks to assemble a movement. We didn't even have the, the assembly plans. Part of the, the parts were missing. Some of the parts were badly made. We had to do them ourselves. And in June 2007, we managed to deliver the first two pieces, and it's a good thing, because two weeks after, I would have been bankrupt. And we delivered the first 30 pieces. The problem had already got 35% in advance, so we were delivering the watches with no margin. That's not a good business model. You don't have to go to MBA courses to know that. So 2007, we scraped through. What did I learn? The first thing I learned is that as soon as I could was to integrate as much competence in-house as possible. Of course, clearly, at those days, I had no possibility. So now we're 26 in the company, and uh, we've got three engineers who are developing all the movements in-house. We've got the prototyping. We've actually got the machining. We've got four CNCs. I had said when I created the company, we would never manufacture anything ourselves. Well, guess what? We are. We need to protect ourselves. What we have also learned is, it seems natural, but we try, even though we craft 218 watches a year, that is nothing over six different calibers, we try to double up all of our suppliers, if it's possible, which is ridiculous. Imagine to do 220 cases, I've got one, um, one uh, artisan who does about 120 and the other one does 100 in case of. And now we've started doing the cases in-house also in case of. Um, what did I learn? Karma can be a bitch, but it can be a fantastic ally. The people who helped me in those days came out from where I didn't expect it. Some I'd helped over the years, some I'd never even met. But I think if you treat people respectfully, treat people the way you want to be treated, which I've always done all my life, because that's what my, my parents have taught me, well, at some point, somebody will come and help you. And that's been the whole story of MBNF the last 14 years. 2008, we start seeing a bit of light at the end of the tunnel. We launch HM2. Um, the retailers love it. They order like crazy. This was another era that retailers were buying them by tens. That doesn't happen anymore. And um, something happened on the first week of September 2008. Lehman Brothers goes down. But we in the whole watch industry, what do we do? We're in complete denial. I remember all these articles, we in the high-end luxury will not be impacted. Well, guess what? First week of January, 2000, third week of January 2009 is the wake-up call. 
is SIHH. We are, of course, not in the SIHH in those days. I had, for the first time, rented a suite in one of the hotels next door. And um, my production plan was 175 pieces, because the year before, I'd done 125. You know how long it takes to craft an MBNF piece? It takes between 12 and 18 months. So by June 2008, I have already put in the production plan everything of 2009. That's before Lehman Brothers goes down. The watches are coming out. All the components are coming out. In Geneva, which was the only fair we were doing in those days, we took 17 pieces on order. A disaster. We ended up the year at 143. How, what happened? Well, luckily for me, this happened, our HM3, my, my first space age piece. Um, even though nothing was selling, that actually sold. Now, we're talking a few pieces, of course. But more importantly, I was traveling that year 260 days out of 365. Every, I was all the time helping our retailers to present the pieces, meeting press, meeting uh, clients. I was telling the story all the time. I arrived at the end of that year. We'd saved the year, but I was this close to complete burnout. Emotional, physical, I was wiped out. So what did I learn there? Optimism is rarely your ally. We've got a natural tendency of thinking that everything is going to be OK. When Lehman Brothers goes down, we're like, yeah, but we'll be OK. And we keep on doing this in the watch industry. We'll be OK. Well, we're not. We have to look at the hard facts. And you have to trust your guts. You have to look, listen to the small signals and have a contingency plan. From that, I've learned. I've become a little bit paranoid, I must admit. But that saved me and the company many times. 2010. So I'm wiped out. We've come out of 2007, we're nearly bankrupt. 2009, we barely scraped through. And what do we do? We launch the craziest ever movement we'd ever launched in those days. Now, you have to imagine in 2010, watchmaking was not where it, where it is today. And we create the Thunderbolt. Six months before we launch that piece, I've got it, the prototype in my hands, and I'm telling my team, guys, nobody's ever going to buy this. And they look at me in awe, like, wait a minute, who's gonna, what's going to pay our salaries? And I'm like, honestly, I have no idea. What I, actually, yeah, I thought was going to happen, happened. I go to Basel, present it to the retailers. They all look at it and go, do you have something else? <laughs> I'm like, no. See you next year. Uh, we took, I think, 12 pieces in order. I needed to, to amortize this insane investment. I needed to sell 100 pieces over four years, so about 25 pieces a year. We took 12 pieces on order. And then a miracle happened. In June or July, I can't remember, we do the launch. The launch is me sending about 200 emails to 200 journalists saying, hi, this is my new product. And um, suddenly the phone starts ringing. Suddenly emails start coming in. The retailer's like, <clears throat> do you still have that weird thing you showed us in Basel? I'm like, yeah. Well, there's actually a, a guy in my store who wants to buy it. Can you ship it? And over four years, there has never been one HM4 in a store. They were all pre-sold. So the piece which terrified me the most actually became our absolute fastest and best bestseller. They still go now at auction at retail or over retail, which is unheard of for an independent brand. Um, that's going to liberate me. That's going to free me, because at the same time, I need to be a bit terrified to create. But that's going to allow me to go to the next step. 2011, to everybody's shock, after we've created all these crazy horological machines, we launched the first ever round watch. My team and me battled like crazy. None of my team wanted to do this. We have not joined MBNF to do a round watch, I heard. Well, I wanted to do this because it's my tribute to the great master watchmakers of the 18th and 19th century, which have made me love this industry. 
the first ever flying balance wheel. And uh, because my mother was Indian, I finally created a, a watch with two time zones where I actually can go to India. Anybody who's been to India knows there's a half an hour time zone. And when you've got a GMT watch, it just doesn't work. So I finally did that. And um, we created the first mad gallery. For those of you who've been to Geneva to a little gallery, um, we created a mechanical and kinetic art gallery. We had no idea what we were doing. When we opened, I had, nobody in the company had ever done retail, me included. Never, nobody had done a gallery. And um, we didn't have even a credit card machine, and we didn't even know who to ask for that. So on the fifth day, when somebody actually wanted to buy something, it was very embarrassing. Um, so this is the, the Dubai one, because in the meantime, we've actually, it's been such a success that we created from Geneva, we went then to create one in Taipei, one in Dubai, and one in Hong Kong. And then we go into 2012, and things are looking really great. We start getting all the kudos of the industry, get the Grand Prix d'Orlogie of Geneva. We um, launch a piece which was very important for me because I wanted to be a car designer as a kid. It's the first car-related piece, which is the HM5. It's the, that's the back of the Lamborghini Miura. And we create, with my good friends um, Felix Baumgartner and Martin Fry, we create a capsule pop-up brand. Virtually nobody's ever heard of this. Urwerk MBNF, we get together, and we've been working for years on this, to create C3H5N309. I think most of us can't even remember the name. It's the um, chemical um, formula of nitroglycerin. Well, that's clearly going to blow up in our face. What's going to happen? In August to September 2012, we had about, still, MBNF, 5 million francs on order to deliver. We lose 4 million. 80% of our open orders in one month phew, disappear. First, the case maker doing the HM5 tells us, well, sorry, dudes, but I cannot make it this year. I'm going to deliver it next year. I'm like, sorry. <laughs> no, we can't. We're just, we're, we've got too much work. So that's like 1.5 million out. Second, a few of our key retailers start playing games with us, saying, bullying us. Um, yeah, I'll take the new product you came out with, but um, you're going to have to take the old stock, which has been here for two years, buy it back. You know if you do that, first of all, cash-wise, well, you're dead. But more <laughs> importantly, if you accept that, every time they give you an order, in their mind, it's whatever it is, I'll send it back. So I told all of them to go to hell and that we were closing them. We lost a million francs of orders. And then, Nitro as we call it, we did an internet launch. There were only 12 pieces that year and the 12 pieces the year after, and it was only going to be sold online. This is 12, 2012, huh? This is not now. And why? Because Urwerk and us had completely different distribution, different margins, and it was anyway only going to be 12 pieces uh, for two years. Um, Urwerk was probably doing about 150. I was doing about 200. What was 12 pieces? Well, some of our retailers took it really bad. And actually, not only the retailers, the sales staff. The salespeople who believed in MBNF and helped me build the brand felt betrayed. And they stopped selling MBNF, especially in my most important market, which was Singapore. My biggest retailer, who was selling 50 pieces a year, suddenly, that's about four or five pieces a month, for four months sold one watch. The sales staff were teaching me a lesson. I tried to go there and explain, but the management said, no, no, everybody hates you, don't come. And then finally, in September, they allowed me to come and explain. I took everybody out to lunch and dinner and said, guys, do you think I'm trying to betray you? This is a, con this is a conceptual thing. For 12 watches, because of the margins, because of everything, I'm not trying to sell directly. I'm just trying to do an experiment. It was actually called experiment. And they got over it. I'd lost 80% of my orders three months before the end of the year. I've got, in those days, I think about 13 employees. I have no idea how I'm going to pay the salaries. And what do we do? Instead of firing or laying off half of our people, we actually hire one more person. We hire our first sales director. 
Because up till then, I was the sales director. I'm not very good. I'm actually a pretty useless sales director. And so um, with everything we did, we worked with the supplier to, to manage to do that famous case, which was late. We worked with the retailers to try and sell more. We, um, the retailers are told to go to hell, finally came back and said, OK, 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 I will not send the product back. And we scraped through 2012 and managed to get into the next year. So what did we learn there? And that's very important. I think we, we always forget that. Perception is too often reality. Because we never meant any ill with Nitro. We never thought we were going to be a competition to our retailers, but they perceived it that way. That's the first thing which is important. And if you want to stay alive in this industry when you're a small player, you have to understand how people perceive you, whatever you think you're doing. Standing your ground gathers respect. When you're in a tough, dire situation, your first reaction is to transgress your values and try and make some money anyway. We never did that. Telling the retailers we're not interested in the way you're working, telling them we're ready to walk away, which I can tell you my team was looking at me like, what are you doing, actually turned out to be the best decision ever. From that day onwards, our relationship with our retailers has been pristine. But we had to make the point. Do not let yourself be bullied. 2013. We come out with our Legacy 2, with two flying balance wheels. We come out with our first ever co-creation where we design for uh, Roche, the music boxes. Um, and that's when I was telling you, 2013, I decide we're not going to grow anymore. From there on, it's flat. Probably the best, one of the best decisions I've ever taken. And we come into 2014, and we come out with the wildest movement ever since HM4, the HM6, the Space Pirate, with this crazy piece. It's a very big success, amazingly, again. We come out with the very first movement we've created in-house, because we had since then started incorporating uh, engineers in-house, the 101. And we come out with the first clock co-creation with our friends from Lepe. We just launched the 10th co-creation with them uh, this, this week. And um, we nearly went bankrupt. What happened? In 2012, I got what I think you will call the God's complex. Because we were, we'd overcome 2007, we'd overcome 2009, we'd overcome 2012, I started thinking, I can do whatever I want. And I thought, instead of doing one new caliber every year, which is crazy, one completely new caliber every year when the size we are is already insane. I mean, you, you can't even imagine the investment it means. The, 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 we, every, everything we make, we put into that. I thought, we're going to do two calibers a year. Wasn't that a great idea? My team thought it was great. I thought it was great. Unfortunately for me, or fortunately for me in some cases, I do not have any financial advice. I have no financial controller. And we just went ahead. In 2014, we had seven straight months of negative cash flow. Because we were developing two calibers for that year and two calibers for the year after. That means 1,500 references of components. When you launch a, a product and you're going to do like 25 a year, you do not do 25 wheels the first year. You do 200 wheels. For like, you do four years of production and you do 50 because they're going to be damaged between the manufacturing, the hand finishing, the plating, and the assembly, and another 50 for the after sales service for the next 50 years. So the cash you need to launch a new caliber makes that you're in negative cash flow severely the first year you launch it. That was like 300,000 components we were trying to finance at any given time, and we just couldn't. Middle of 2014, we thought we were going to die. So we cut everything we could. The only thing we didn't was our team. I assembled a team in August, and I told them, guys, you're the best team I've ever had. 
you're going to have to help me. We're going to cut everything we can, but you guys stay on board. Because if we manage to get through this, we'll have learned a lot of things. We got through it. I still wonder how. And we got into, sorry, in 2015. So, and that's actually the, um, the most important lesson. Success is your worst ally. Which is a little bit counterintuitive. <laughs> I think a few of the people in the industry are starting to feel a few stings these days. Um, when you start being pretty good at what you do and when you get the success and when you get the money, that's when you lose all bearing to reality. And that was the best lesson we ever learned. So we get into 2015, and it's our 10th anniversary. Our, our baseline from there onwards is a creative adult is a child who survived. And to to, to rejoice on that, we created Melchior the Robot and the HMX watch. So the HMX was X as 10th anniversary. It was, um, most brands, when they do an anniversary, they will create the most important, most expensive piece they've ever created. We decided to do a gift. Well, I decided. Meaning, we created this little line of pieces. There were 80 pieces. That's a third of our production. And I told my team, we're not going to make any margin on it. We're going to say thank you to all the people who actually allowed us to come to that 10th anniversary. So it came out at 29,000 francs when it should have been about at 48.50. And um, the day before uh, the fair, the most important part of my team came into my office, locked the door and said, you're not going ahead with that crazy idea. I mean, we've just barely got out of 2014 and you want to actually make, making not, no margin. We're a company which makes, I think the best we ever made was 3% profit. So when you don't make any profit, your margin is covering your operating costs. And um, you're going to actually make massive losses on these pieces. And I said, yes, and I held my ground. And it's probably one of the best decisions again we made because yes, we lost money. But the way of saying thank you was an incredible solidifying effect on the tribe of our collectors. And um, so that's the piece. And that's when we launched also that year the perpetual calendar. I would need an, uh, another half an hour to treat that one. It's a triple revolution in watchmaking. The most important part, what I want to tell you here, is the man who created it is the only genius I've ever met. His name is Stephen McDonnell. He's from Belfast. He's a Northern Irish. Uh, I'm going to say a watchmaker, but he actually did um, theology at Oxford and he actually never learned watchmaking. That man, who's a genius, created that movement over three and a half years for us, and we launched it then. And he was one of the five watchmakers who saved my company in 2007. And four years later, I heard he was in difficulty. And I went to see him. I said, how can I help you? You saved my company. He said, I've got an idea of a perpetual calendar. I said, no, 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 not a perpetual calendar. They never work. He said, that's the point. I think I've got an idea which is going to make one which actually works. And so I, we bankrolled him blindly. And he created this extraordinary movement, which I'm wearing today. And uh, again, karma is incredible. 2016, 2018. We've created all these different pieces, HM8, the Moon Machine 2, Aquapod, HM9, we just relaunched a few months ago, Split Escapement, Alien Nation, performance art pieces, um, all the different co-creations. And um, it's been doing incredibly well. The sales have been much higher than our production over all these different years. And, um, the only thing I'm scared of today is that success is our worst ally. But the only thing I know today is that we're going to have some sort of big problem. It's maybe going to be tomorrow, maybe it's been three months, maybe it's going to be in three years. We know we're going to be hit by something. That's what happens when you're an entrepreneur. But what's great, what I have really learned over the years is that um, it's only by falling down and getting back up on your feet that you become wiser and you become stronger. So that's very, and I'll just finish with that. I've got two little daughters, one is two, one is five. And I realized that to have a great life, they need to fall down and get back up on their feet. But we as parents, 
We always want to protect our kids. We want them to have a better life than us, but they need to fall down and get back up on their feet. That's the single most important lesson I've had. Thank you very much. Thank you, Max. Thank you for being so so open before we follow this. I have a couple of questions for you, but let's first see whether anyone here in the auditorium has any question for Max. If you do, just raise your hand, and the microphone is going to come for you. Not the case. OK. Uh, well, tell me first, uh, we are in the third day of SIHH. Yeah. How is the salon going for MBNF so far? Well, and maybe come back into the light. <laughs> back into the light. Um, I, I set up our company always for success. So meaning the, the secret of happiness is having very low expectations and exceeding them. Okay. So we always come to the fairs, be it SIHH or Basel, with super limited editions where we normally know that we're going to sell much more. It didn't happen before. Before, I was always, please buy my watch. Now, <laughs> if I think I can sell 25, I'll do an edition of 12. So we're OK. We're okay. doing great. OK. Uh, the graph is interesting, but there was a third graph that come to my mind, came to my mind by listening to you, and it is, over the year, we have uh, uh, increase the number of collaborations. Yes. Significantly. Yeah. Uh, how do you choose the companies and brands with whom you collaborate? What, what are your criteria? Well, first of all, the companies, the people, I, I actually don't work with companies, I work with people, always. Mm -hmm. The people I work with are always people I have to admire. They are creators, engineers, watchmakers who have something which is different and have got great human values. I've learned, it's been, I've been doing creative joint ventures for now 20 years. The first opus at Harry Winston was soon about 18 years ago. And um, I've understood one thing. For a great joint venture, you need to have the same values. You need to have the same goals. If one of the parties wants to create a great product and the other one just wants to make money, it's never going to happen. And if you understand that, and you're uh, both a little bit crazy and ready not to make money, you create usually a great product. Many other companies have tried this kind of co-branding adventure, have gone with brands that have a power either in image or marketing. You seem to choose mostly partners that are like you into engineering, essentially. It I choose partners um, who are more or less the same size or smaller, sometimes larger, but it's, the goal has to be to create a great product and to create a great experience. The goal must never be because you think you're going to attract more clients or you think you're going to make more money. And that's how we have... Actually, one of our biggest issues today is the level of expectations of the public. <laughs> Meaning, seven, eight years ago, Nobody was waiting for a new MBNF. Now, again, don't get me wrong, most people don't even know that we exist. But the tribe of people who know we exist, who've followed us over the years, they expect to be wowed. And every year, they're in front of their computer going, you better wow me. And this is horrible. As a creator, <laughs> it's terrifying. So before I was terrified that nobody's going to buy my watch, now I'm terrified that people are going to be disappointed. disappointed but absolutely. you can't think that way, otherwise you get complete creator's block. So by also co-creating, you bring new blood, you, you bring fresh ideas, and you often arrive where people don't expect you. Yeah. I continue creating my own story. I write my biography. That's my biography. But working with other people enriches my life and my biography. One last question about the Mad Gallery. You pointed out uh, that you have four of them now. Yeah. But uh, just to clarify, that's not an MBNF store. That's nope. a separate project. It's a gallery with, I assume, also MBNF watches and, and, and machines. But uh, at the same time, it's a real gallery. It explores it's, it's the work of other creators. It's a real mechanical and kinetic art gallery. Um, if you enter, uh, actually, on mad galleries, usually you don't even see the watches, mm -hmm. um, first of all, because they're small, but also because that's not what we're about. Mm -hmm. We want to give a decoding machine to people who can try and understand what we're trying to do, mm -hmm. meaning we create mechanical art, not to give time. So once you've understood that with different other artists, you may understand what we do. But more importantly, as, as I grow older, um, I think I was a very um, self-centered young man. I was trying to save myself. I come from 
my journey has been a long journey. Um, I've, a very long time, I have um, not helped many people. Mm -hmm. I've helped myself. And over the last 10 years, 15 years, now it gives me much more joy to help somebody else than actually to write my own story. So that was, that's what the Mad Gallery is about. Excellent. Max, thank you very much. Thank you. And good luck for the rest of the salon. Thank you very much. Thank you. And this uh, ends this session and the live stream. So I'm going to say goodbye to those who have been watching online and uh, thanks to you here. Uh, the next session is going to be at 11 and we're going to unveil the winner of this year's Young Talent Competition by FP uh, Journe here in the studio at 11 a.m. Geneva time. See you then.